can you hear me? Fair enough. Um, right. So yeah, um, I'm Matthias. I'm a, a PhD student um, at ETH in, in Zurich. And um, yeah, I want to present to you today a work that I did, which is maybe something a bit unusual. So this is a, a perspective. This is basically a, a synthesis of literature, and, and it is um, concerned with the collective metabolism that we see in microbial communities and, and how this might be driven by proteome efficiency of, of individuals. And before I, I get into the talk, I wanted to take a quick um, moment to thank the organizers for, for letting me speak here. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge briefly that you know, this work um, is, the, is the product of being in a really friendly and welcoming and open-minded research environment at, at EAVAC and ETH, and particularly a wonderful group of researchers, um, the Microbial Systems Ecology Group, um, who um, many of us are here. In fact, not all of these people are in the audience, so uh, <laughs> maybe they're not so great. Uh, no, I don't know. I need to talk to them about this. But uh, usually these are great people, so come uh, find and, and talk to them. Um, this group, uh, as, as some of you might know, is, uh, or used to be led by Martin Ackermann, who I think you know, or some of you, but uh, since the beginning of this year, it's also co-led by Olga Schubert, and she is awesome, so if you get um, an opportunity to meet her, um, take it. Um, so what I wanted to do in this talk was to first unpack these two key um, concepts, collective metabolism and proteome efficiency. I wanted to talk a little bit about how they are related, and then um, I wanted to take one particular example of a motif of collective metabolism and show in more detail how this is driven by proteome efficiency um, of individuals. So um, talking about collective metabolism, let's, let's do this little hypothetical um, thought experiment where um, we um, are concerned with an ecosystem function of, of interest, in this case, carbon cycling, and we could think that this is done by an extremely generalist microbe. So this microbe has the capacity to um, use some sort of redox gradient or sunlight to fix CO2 and other inorganics into biomass, and it also has the capacity to, once this biomass decayed, recycle it back into its constituent substrates. Now, um, in reality, because we can sequence ecosystems, we know that there's actually not a single very generalist organism, but instead there's a whole community of more specialized organisms. These organisms often interact metabolically, and so this process of carbon cycling becomes a collective process, a collective function of the community. So what's currently really or relatively straightforward for us to do is to determine the composition of this community so we sort of know who's around. And with um, a little bit more effort, we can also determine the function of the community, like the, the rate of carbon cycling. But I think what has become really, really clear throughout this meeting in the last couple of days is that what we're really interested in is to know who is doing what in these sorts of communities. Right? So we see that the metabolic capacity seem to be distributed among different specialists. Um, so we would like to know, you know, who are these specialists? Who is doing what? What are the roles um, that uh, different community members take? Um, and how do they interact with, um, with other community members? Um, so it would be really cool if we could get at something like this, like a structure of collective metabolism. And I think the sort of um, maybe wishful thinking grand goal of this community should be that we can that we um, gather so much knowledge on, on microbial physiology and ecology that we just look at any sort of ecosystem and then we can predict more or less this map, right? We can basically say, ah, we expect this sort of collective metabolism to go on. And obviously, we're, we're you know, quite a long way away from this, but what we were wondering for this work is, I mean, how far have we come so far? You know, what, with all of the knowledge that we already have on microbial physiology and ecology, what sort of predictions maybe can we make? Um, so what we did here was we, we went into the literature on physiology and ecology, and we mainly asked three main questions. These questions are, in what way are metabolic capacities distributed among these interacting specialists? And why and under which conditions are the metabolic capacities distributed? And the, the answer that we found and that we want to, to put forward or, or maybe to suggest is that um, this, this specialization that's going on and that underlies this distribution of metabolic capacities, this increases the proteome efficiency of, um, 
of the specialists. And this will be the, the perfect moment to um, say what I mean with, uh, with proteome efficiency. So I want, to, I want to explain proteome efficiency with one hopefully very straightforward example, and, and I will use these, these infamous pie charts um, basically to show um, how a cell in different conditions would allocate uh, its proteome to, to various different functions. Um, so let's take this extremely simplified model of, of, of metabolism and growth um, where substrates are being transformed by metabolic proteins into cellular building blocks and energy, and then those are being used by ribosomes to make the metabolic proteins, to also make the ribosomes, and to make some housekeeping proteins. Um, and let's assume that a large fraction of the metabolic proteins are required to make this one amino acid. Um, and then let's ask what happens if this amino acid becomes available in the environment. Usually cells will take it up, right? And because this only requires a transport and not a whole biosynthetic pathway, um, we, we need fewer proteome resources to take up the amino acid. So the point here is that the uptake of an amino acid is more proteome efficient than its biosynthesis. And you know, generally, any process that fulfills a function but requires less protein than an alternative would be called proteome efficient. And there's one really important consequence of being proteome efficient, and that is that now you've freed up resources. Um, these resources are protein biosynthetic resources, so ribosomes that can now do something else as well as, as the substrates that were originally going to synthesize this protein. And now, um, with these freed up resources, a cell can do many things, and this really depends on the environment that the cell finds itself in. For example, in the sort of boom and bust environments that Sergei talked about, it might be really helpful to just grow really quickly. So in that case, the freed up resources can be allocated to make more ribosomes and to grow faster. But in a more variable environment, you could reallocate these resources to make proteins to metabolize a potential future substrate and then lag shorter when the environment switches to this sort of substrate. Um, in more supply rate limited environments, so environments that reflect more chemostats, we heard from, from Justus today, but also from Sergei, that here it's really about driving down the concentration of the limiting nutrient. Right? And you can achieve a given uptake rate at a lower concentration if you invest more in transporters. And then finally, you could also not invest these resources or reallocate these resources at all. You would effectively reduce the size of your proteome and reduce the requirements in terms of substrate and energy for maintaining this proteome. And this might be particularly important um, for a cell that's, that's starving. So the point I'm trying to make is really um, proteome efficiency is this very versatile um, thing that can facilitate a whole bunch of fitness-relevant traits. So how does it link back to trying to predict the structure of, of collective metabolism? And the, the point that we want to make here is that metabolic capacities are distributed among specialists. Cells specialize because this makes them more proteome efficient. And then in certain ways of specializing, um, this entails, so it requires or facilitates a metabolic interaction and then it will underlie the sort of collective metabolism. So this is basically the main result of all of this work. And this is the, let's say, first tiny step to going towards predicting the structure of collective metabolism from the knowledge um, that we currently have on microbial physiology. Or, um, or maybe I should say from the knowledge that I had eight months ago. When, we, um, when this was finished and sent out to journals. So I think I've already learned some things in the last couple of days where some of the nuances here um, need to be updated. But basically, we identified um, or classified five general motifs of collective metabolism. And in all of these motifs, cells specialize to become more proteome efficient, but then they require or facilitate an interaction, um, a metabolic interaction. And so because I can't go through all of these um, in one talk, uh, unless I have like two hours or so, I wanted to focus on one of them, but also I wanted to like say a word or two about all of them so that hopefully you know, if some of them strike your interest, it would be super cool if we could discuss this um, throughout the rest of this meeting. 
So uh, generally, in this, in this first type of mode, this is going on whenever um, a part of metabolism happens extracellularly. For example, the, the degradation of chitin. That usually cells um, or microbes can specialize in the sense that they do not produce this enzyme to break down, um, for example, a polymer, but they can still take up the product. So some people would call this uh, cheating. And then the reason for why they are more proteome efficient is quite um, obvious because they're simply not producing this enzyme um, to break down the polymer, but that also means that they require another cell to do this for them. So this is um, one way where specialization then leads to requiring another, um, another microbe. This um, second type or motif of collective metabolism is something that we've heard about quite a lot in this meeting, and it is that often catabolic pathways are split between specialist cells. So we've heard about acetate cross-feeding and lactate cross-feeding and so on. Here, the idea that is that, for example, a sugar um, catabolizing microbe can specialize in the sense that it can run only a partial pathway. It would then secrete a partially catabolized intermediate, like an organic acid. And the point is really that by running a shorter pathway, um, you can under certain um, circumstances, which I will go into in the last part of the talk, you can generate energy more proteome efficiently. But then, because you release a not fully catabolized um, substrate, you facilitate an interaction with um, a different micro uh, community member. In um, motive uh, three, we are concerned, uh, or we talk about the exchange of anabolites like amino acids. Um, or vitamins, and, and I think we haven't heard so much about this in, in this meeting, but my, um, my wonderful colleague uh, Divya is doing great work on this, and she will, she will give a talk um, on her work uh, next week, so you should see that. Um, and these last two motifs are really based on um, instances where metabolic functions um, conflict with, uh, with each other, and there's basically two flavors of this in one flavor, the one enzyme, or one um, intermediate or a product of one metabolic function really inhibits the enzymes of another metabolic function. And in this other flavor, two metabolic functions might require um, metabolism to run in opposing directions. So for example, um, autotrophic and heterotrophic metabolism. And the, the pink berries that Otto talked about are basically an, an instance of this type of, of motif of collective metabolism. Okay, so I will next go um, to talk about one motif in more detail. Um, are there any questions? This is a very, I think it's a very nice conceptual uh, uh, sort of framework to think about, but also these guys, while they're doing this happy world uh, um, uh, scenario, they're also trying to kill each other with toxins and uh, what more. So yeah. that makes the collective protein less efficient, I guess. That's true, yeah. I think this is describing basically one side and the happy side of, of ecology. And I think, I think you can start um, taking these concepts, you know, how much protein do you need to invest to, for example, kill someone? I think you can, you can extend this to also competitive interactions, but we, we haven't uh, gone there yet. What kind of cells are you working on? I, uh, so th this is, this, I think, um, I, I'm not presenting this, this well enough. So this is the, 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 the misconception. That people usually ask me, like, what have I done in terms of experiments? And really what I've done is I, I went into the literature and I looked at all sorts of, you know, types of model organisms that people worked with. A lot of, this, um, a lot of these results are, are based on, uh, on your work, um, you know, with, uh, with E. coli. But, uh, yeah. Okay. But you, you, were you here uh, in my second talk? No. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we don't find this uh, for slow growing bacteria. What do you not find? We find that uh, protein want to be inefficient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we should talk about this more, <laughs> not in front of an audience. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm really sad I had to miss, I had to miss the uh, first two days. There was another, um, there was another meeting that, that happened that I really needed to go to. Um, but let's talk about it. Yeah. And let's, um, so let's talk, let's talk about this motif. 
in, uh, in more detail. So the idea here is, is again, um, that um, catabolizing a, a um, let's say, an electron donor like, like a sugar uh, cells could specialize to um, basically oxidize this sugar only partially. Um, there might be an argument uh, that says that this generates energy in a more proteome efficient way. Then they would release an intermediate, and then this intermediate can now cross feed um, another organism. I wanted to, to quickly motivate this by saying that we find these sorts of cross feeding in various different systems. We find them for organotrophs in probably aerobic systems in, in lab communities. We definitely find this in anaerobic systems like the human gut. And we also find this for chemolithotrophs. So not only organo, uh, organotrophs. So here, this is an example of, of nitrifying organisms and the nitrification process, which is basically the oxidation of ammonium to nitrite and nitri uh, nitrite to nitrate. And this is usually carried out by two interacting cells. So the question really is, why do cells perform this partial catabolism? And uh, people who have thought about this, this is basically the, the previous generation of, of uh, systems biologists. And what they want to know is, is how can we, along this sort of example toy pathway, how can we optimally allocate enzymes along this pathway to maximize its rate? And what would be the optimal length of the pathway to maximize um, energy production? Um, so this pathway basically has uh, an extracellular electron donor at a certain concentration. This gets taken up into the cell by a transporter. Then there's a couple of intracellular um, oxidation steps that all generate energy, and then the final or intermediate product is expelled from the cell again. Um, there's a couple of more parameters that, that come into play when describing this mathematically. So there's a length of the pathway. This is the number of, of reaction steps. There's this M, which is the number of um, intracellular intermediates a number of ATP generating or energy generating steps, an energy generation rate, and a pathway reaction rate. And the way that this is uh, implemented um, is, is extremely simplified. So all of the enzymes have um, identical um, characteristics, or the same size and the same, um, the same rate constant. And the, um, the reaction rates, I think, for, for mathematical tractability, I guess, um, modeled as, as linear and, and irreversible. So there are two main and important ingredients that come uh, into play or that were postulated for this model. And this is that there are two um, pools of limiting resources. Pool one is a limiting um, amount of intracellular substrate that a cell is allowed to have and allowed to um, distribute along this pathway, and um, basically for osmotic reasons. And I, I think we've seen in, in um, in, in Terry's talk that cells take osmotic insults seriously and they try to keep osmotic homeostasis. And the second um, uh, pool of, of limited resources is, is enzymes that can be distributed along this pathway. So in this toy and, and not very biological example of, of sugar oxidation to, to CO2, um, it could look like this for a complete pathway uh, run by a more generalist cell. And now the question is, uh, what happens when we reduce the pathway length? Um, can we make an argument that now, with the reduced pathway length, we can, we can somehow generate energy um, more proteome efficiently? And what sort of speaks for that is that by reducing the pathway length, these two pools of limited resources, substrate concentrations and enzyme concentrations, that both affect the rate of the pathway now get sort of um, allocated among fewer reactions. So the rate of each reaction basically um, profits in a, in a quadratic um, manner. But at the same time, we have fewer energy couplings. So what we can see is that if we decrease the length of the pathway, we always get an increase in the pathway reaction rate. And what we also see is that this increase is more dramatic when the electron donor concentration is high. And um, I think this becomes sort of understandable when we look at how enzymes ought to be optimally distributed along this pathway. So it's really just this dichotomy between the first transporting enzyme and all other enzymes. Where at low concentrations of the electron donor, most of the enzyme needs to go into the transporter. Um, and at high electron donor concentrations, only very few very little of your limited enzyme pool needs to go to the transporter, and most can go in, in the rest of the pathway. 
So basically, if we cut these two steps, OX2 and OX3, um, we can gain different amounts of enzyme to distribute um, based on the electron donor concentration. We gain here in, in dark red very little enzyme to distribute at um, low electron donor concentrations and a lot of enzyme to distribute at high electron donor concentrations. So therefore, this increase is more steep when the electron donor concentration is high. And what this also means is that the energy production rate has different optima, uh, optimal pathway lengths for different um, electron donor concentrations. So at a low concentration, this um, pathway that we call complete is the optimum for energy production. And at high concentrations, a short pathway is optimal. And then we can sort of flip this around to speak about proteome efficiency. We can ask um, for a given energy production rate, how much protein would you need to invest having a short pathway compared to a long pathway? And this is basically um, what we see in this plot, where at low electron donor concentrations, the short pathway requires much more protein for a given energy production rate. But as we increase the concentration of the electron donor, the short pathway becomes more proteome efficient at generating energy. And I think basically this is something that we see in E. coli, where as we increase glucose concentration, at some point we see overflow metabolism, so a more partial catabolism kick in. Um, and we also see this in the other direction with the example of, of nitrification, where this uh, usually two-step process of ammonium and nitride oxidation becomes a one-step process at really low, uh, so, uh, sorry, maybe becomes carried out by a single organism at really low concentrations of ammonium. And this, uh, this is then called Comamox. Now, um, the, the problem about this, uh, I realize, is that Martina, in her talk, showed some data <laughs> which was that when you increase the concentration of glucose, you actually do not see that the community becomes more structured into a glucose, oxid a glucose ferment and an organic acid um, oxidizer. So this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> which, um, so therefore, um, in, 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 in the coffee break, I like, frantically put together another slide to maybe be able to, to make sense of this. Um, and this slide uh, has to do with how energy generation steps are um, distributed along a pathway. So Martina told us that her cultures are always shaking super rapidly. So they, they, there should be oxygen. You know? in, in our toy pathway, the, the energy generation steps were distributed equally along the pathway. In a real pathway, for example, glucose catabolism, we know that more energy can, in principle, be gained um, in oxidative phosphorylation. So any NADH that we get to reduce oxygen, this is where we gain more of the energy. And in glycolysis, we don't gain a lot of NADH, but in a TCA cycle, we gain more NADH. So basically, the, the, the quality of the electron acceptor, or whether or not there is an electron acceptor, tells us how much a catabolic pathway is backloaded in terms of energy production um, opportunities or front-loaded. And I think you can show this quite nicely um, in this redox tower that gives us a, a sense of, of how um, energetically favorable uh, a redox reaction is. When we oxidize glucose with oxygen as an acceptor, we have this, this large distance. So really, most of the energy can be generated at the end of the pathway. When the electron acceptor is nitrate, this is already less so. Um, less so with sulfide or sulfur as electron acceptors. And even worse, when there is basically no electron acceptor and the cell can only ferment. So I think what, is, what this is basically saying is that um, the more energy front-loaded a pathway becomes, the more favorable partial catabolism is. Um, so in, in anaerobic environments or in the absence of oxygen, we should see more of the splitting of catabolic pathways. And so to, 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 to wrap up, um, I basically asked in, in what way are metabolic capacities distributed in, in a community? And for this particular motif, the answer is really that catabolic pathways can be split between specialists, where one specialist um, performs a partial catabolism, releases an intermediate, and then this cross-feeds another specialist. Um, question two and three were why and under which conditions are metabolic capacities distributed? And here, the, the answer, I think, is really that partial catabolic pathways 
can always run faster and they can generate energy more proteome efficiently if the substrate concentrations are high and when um, pathways are more energy front loaded. So for example, when poor quality acceptors are around or when there are no external electron acceptors. And so to sort of bring this back into, into um, the whole perspective, what we, what we set out and hope to do is maybe with the, the bit of knowledge that we've already gathered, what can we do in terms of predicting the structure of collective uh, metabolism? The, um, the key here, we, we think, is that metabolic capacities are distributed because cells specialize. Cells specialize because that makes their metabolism more proteome efficient. Um, but then in various cases, these are these five motifs that we describe, um, this entails uh, metabolic interactions. And that's the last thing I wanted to say. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening in and happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the talk. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, but the, you know, when, when you split and metabolite leaves the cell, okay, your, uh, a lot of metabolites are lost. Can you repeat? When you split? Right, when you, when you split a, a, a pathway, right? yeah. a lot of metabolites are lost. How so? Right. Huh? What, what do you mean they're lost? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So um, I guess one could say that you know, this, this type of, of, of interactions really depend also on the environment. You know, how turbulent is an environment? How much spatial structure is there? Can there be a biofilm where diffusion is, is more limited and metabolites get less lost? And I think this is something, some of the basically conditions to say, oh, how likely is it that we see more um, collective metabolism versus more generalists? And turbulence or something like that is definitely something that I'm, I'm just concerned when you're using you know, what we know about fast-growing organism in, in very kind of a selective uh, conditions, okay, the selective grow fast, uh, applying these to a situation in a community where I'm slow growing, I mean, just barely surviving, yeah. and all that, right? Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, like, like energy, right? Yeah. It's a topic often talked about. Uh, it's certainly a important issue for slow growing communities mm -hmm. fighting for a little bit of mm -hmm. everything. But it's absolutely not a concern for, you know, like the modern organism like mm -hmm. E. coli we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it generates way more energy than it's needed, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, it uses uh, these um, uh, cytochromes that are inefficient. Yeah. Right? It's just, it doesn't bother to get energy. Up. No. And, and, but then mixing these two pictures are, are dangerous. I think, I think often when I, when I present this as well, then people say, oh, this is about energy, and I feel what, what, I, what I'm trying to do um, very deliberately is to say it is more about requiring fewer proteins for a process. And I think in general, this, you know, even a slow growing cell, if it can decide whether to synthesize or take up an amino acid, I think it would take it up. No, that's what, that's what, that's not what you see, right? These oh, no. slow growing organisms, they don't bother to optimize their protein. So they don't, they're very different. They don't take up amino acids. Uh, they, 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 they don't take amino acids, they, they, they keep the as biosynthesis. So they're regulated in a bad way. They don't bother to regulate. Well, I couldn't believe it until we saw like for five slow growing organisms, they're all like that. Yeah. It's, I think like in, in a way it's good that I wasn't around on Tuesday because you would have killed the whole talk. <laughs> Okay, we have time for uh, one more question. I'm less skeptical than Terry, <laughs> but uh, uh, let me just, uh, the, the, the one, the number two which you presented yeah. relied, and the simple explanation which you got from the, from the, from the paper, yeah. relied on this bilinearity of all the reactions, because it's essentially a concentration effect, so when you, when you uh, make your reaction to only do one out of two things, you get a factor four effect. Yeah. How, you know, what, how sensitive it is to what if not all of the internal reactions are 
uh, the internal metabolites are so low that they are actually in this regime where they are below K for, for corresponding reaction. And what happens if you have uh, irreversible reactions? You mentioned that those are two requirements in this simplified model. Yeah, I think um, one, of the, one of the people who did most of this work is, is Jan Ulrich Kreft, and I, I met him at some point, and, and I asked, you know, what happens if you have more reversible, more Michaelis Menten dynamics, and he says, then it's less mathematically tractable, but the results are the same. That's, that's what he told me. And then he showed me some figures uh, that they didn't publish. Um, yeah. Okay, let's thank Matthias again. Okay, just uh, one uh, announcement before we actually do it.